You walk outside on a clear night, look up at the bright white circle hanging in the darkness, and think about how many humans once walked on that thing. Then you remember that was over 50 years ago, and we haven't been back since. What gives? Today, I'll explain why we went to the moon, why we stopped, and why we still haven't returned to you like you're 5 years old. And by the end, you'll understand that this story is way more complicated than just running out of money or losing interest. Now, let's start with why we went there in the first place. Picture two kids on a playground, both claiming that they're the strongest, fastest, and smartest. That's basically what happened between America and Russia back in the 1950s and 1960s. Except, you know, instead of a playground, it was the entire world. And instead of showing off by doing backflips, they were showing off by shooting rockets into space. This cosmic game of anything you can do, I can do better, was called the Space Race. Russia threw the first punch by launching a little metal ball called Sputnik in 1957. It just beeped as it circled Earth, but America freaked out like Russia had just built a Death Star. Then, Russia sent the first person to space, a guy named Yuri Gargarin in 1961. America was getting embarrassed on the world's biggest stage. President John F. Kennedy basically said, Hold my beer, and announced that America would land people on the moon and bring them back safely before the decade was over. Not because it made perfect sense, but because it was the most dramatic way to prove that America was better at the space game. Think of it like this. If your neighbor builds a really tall treehouse, you don't just build a slightly taller one, you build a treehouse on the moon. That is essentially what Kennedy promised, except he was dead serious and had the entire country's reputation riding on it. The Apollo program wasn't just about getting to the moon, it was about doing something so impossibly difficult that only the absolute best could pull it off. Landing on the moon required solving thousands of problems that had never been solved before. How do you land on a surface with no air and gravity that's six times weaker than Earth's? How do you make sure that your astronauts don't die from radiation or run out of air, or get lost in the vast emptiness of space? Every single piece of technology had to be invented from scratch. NASA threw everything that they had at this problem. At its peak, the Apollo program employed over 400,000 people and consumed more than 4% of the entire federal budget. To put that in perspective, if the government spent the same percentage today, NASA would get about $200 billion a year instead of the roughly $25 billion that it's actually getting. The whole country was basically working on this one crazy goal. And it worked! On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon's surface and said those famous words about one small step and one giant leap. America had won the ultimate playground bragging rights. Mission accomplished, microphone dropped, game over. But here's where the story gets really interesting, and where most people's understanding kind of stops. After Apollo 11, America sent five more missions to the moon. Apollo 12 landed successfully. Apollo 13 nearly killed its crew when an oxygen tank exploded, but they made it home safely. Apollo 14, 15, 16, and 17 all landed successfully, with the astronauts spending increasingly longer periods on the lunar surface, driving around in moon buggies and conducting scientific experiments. Then, suddenly, it all stopped. Apollo 18, 19, and 20 were cancelled. The rockets that could reach the moon were retired. The factories that built them were shut down, and the engineers and technicians who all knew how to make it all work scattered to other jobs. By 1975, America had completely dismantled its ability to return to the moon. Now, why would you stop doing something that you'd just proven you could do better than anyone else in the world? Well, the most simple answer that most people give is money. The Apollo program was incredibly expensive, and once America had beaten Russia to the moon, the political motivation kind of disappeared. Congress and the American public lost interest, and without the space race driving urgency, moon missions became just another government program competing for funding against schools, roads, healthcare, and, well, everything else. But that's only one part of the story. The real reason we stopped going to the moon, and why we still haven't returned, are much more complex and reveal something fascinating about how humans make decisions about big, expensive, long-term projects. First, let's talk about what the moon actually offered beyond bragging rights. The moon is basically a giant rock covered in dust, with no air, no water, no life, and nothing particularly valuable that we couldn't get more easily on Earth. The scientific knowledge gained from the Apollo missions was incredible, but after six successful landings, the most obvious discoveries had been made. Each additional mission simply provided diminishing returns in terms of new scientific insights. Compare this to something like the International Space Station, which has been continuously occupied for over 20 years. The space station serves multiple purposes. It's a laboratory for experiments that can only be done in zero gravity, a testbed for technologies needed for longer space missions, and a symbol of international cooperation. 
The moon, by contrast, was primarily a destination to prove it could be reached. The technical challenge also played a role. Getting to the moon and back safely required everything to work perfectly every single time. There was no backup plans, no rescue missions, and no room for any major errors. Apollo 13 showed us just how quickly a routine mission could turn into a life or death emergency. Each moon mission was essentially a controlled explosion that had to be executed flawlessly with astronauts' lives hanging in the balance. As the initial excitement wore off, the enormous risks became harder to justify. The American public had initially been willing to accept those risks because the stakes of the space race seemed existential. But once the race was won, sending people to collect more moon rocks started to seem like an expensive and dangerous hobby. The political landscape also shifted dramatically. Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, before the first moon landing. The Vietnam War was consuming enormous resources and public attention. Social problems at home, including civil rights struggles and urban poverty, made spending billions on space exploration seem tone-deaf to many Americans. The famous protest song asked, Whitney's on the moon, but I can't pay my rent, capturing the growing sentiment that America's priorities were misaligned. And by the early 1970s, the Soviet Union was no longer seen as an existential threat in space. Russia had effectively conceded the moon race and shifted focus to space stations and robotic missions. Without a competitor pushing the pace, America's sense of urgency simply evaporated. But here's where the story gets even more interesting. The decision to stop going to the moon wasn't just about money or politics. It was also about the fundamental nature of human exploration and how society sustained motivation for difficult long-term projects. Throughout history, exploration has usually been driven by one of three things. The search for resources, the need for territory, or competition with rivals. The age of exploration happened because European nations were competing for trade routes and colonies. The American frontier was settled because people were looking for land, gold, and opportunity. But the moon offered none of these traditional motivations. I mean, the moon has no easily accessible resources that could justify the cost of extraction. It has no territory worth claiming in any practical sense. And once America had demonstrated superiority over Russia, the competitive motivation simply disappeared. Without these traditional drivers, sustaining a moon program required something much harder to maintain, pure scientific curiosity and national pride. And this all brings us to why we still haven't gone back, despite having much better technology today than we had back in 1969. Modern computers are millions of times more powerful than the ones that guided Apollo missions. Materialistic science has advanced dramatically. We have better life support systems, more efficient rockets, and decades of additional experience with human spaceflight. The technical capability exists, but the political and economic will doesn't. No single nation today faces the kind of existential competition that drove the original space race. The United States remains the dominant space power, but China, India, and private companies are all developing their own capabilities. This multipolar competition is less intense and more diffuse than the focused rivalry between America and Russia back in the 1960s. The cost calculations have also changed. In 1969, reaching the moon was worth almost any price because the geopolitical stakes were so high. Today, every space program has to justify its existence against other priorities in a more complex political environment. I mean, sending humans to Mars has become the new ambitious goal, making the moon seem like a stepping stone rather than a destination. Private companies like SpaceX have also changed the game by dramatically reducing launch costs, but they're primarily focused on Mars missions and commercial applications. The moon doesn't offer any obvious business opportunities that would attract private investment on the scale needed for human missions. There's also a psychological factor that's often overlooked. The Apollo missions were successful beyond anyone's wildest dreams, but they were also a historical anomaly. Never before had humanity undertaken such a technically complex project on such a tight timeline with such high stakes. The fact that it worked was honestly miraculous. I mean, it worked six times in a row. It's almost unbelievable. People expect moon missions to be routine, safe, and affordable, but the reality is that they remain extraordinarily difficult and dangerous. The gap between public expectations and technical reality makes it even harder to build political support for new moon programs. Recent developments suggest that this might be changing, though. NASA's Artemis program aims to return humans to the moon by the mid-2020s, with the goal of establishing a permanent lunar base. China has announced plans for crew lunar missions. Private companies are developing lunar landers and habitats. The moon is suddenly looking relevant again. Not as a destination for its own sake, but as a proving ground for Mars missions and a potential source of resources for deeper space exploration. The story of why we went to the moon once and then stopped reveals something profound about human nature and how societies make decisions about big, ambitious projects. But sustaining that effort over decades requires different motivations than the ones that get us started. It's about what drives human exploration, how we prioritize competing goals, and what we're willing to risk for knowledge and achievement.
The fact that we've stopped going to the moon says as much about human psychology and political systems as it does about rockets and budgets. So let's recap this whole cosmic adventure. We went to the moon because America and Russia were having the ultimate playground fight, and landing on the moon was the most dramatic way to prove who was cooler. We stopped going because the fight had ended, the moon turned out to be mostly just expensive rocks, and people decided they had better things to spend money on. We haven't gone back because nobody has been motivated enough to deal with the cost, risk, and complexity, even though we totally could if we really wanted to. Now go forth and impress people at parties with your newfound knowledge of lunar geopolitics. Just don't blame me when they start asking you to explain why we haven't been to Mars yet.